On May 16th, 1998, a tragedy occurred. While playing basketball with some friends in Chicago, 15-year-old Christopher Searcy was shot twice in the chest. One of the bullets perforated his aorta. His friends dragged him almost 100 metres to within 15 metres of the entrance to a hospital. Once there, one of his friends went inside to get help. No medical staff came to help. Instead, the doctors and other staff stated, according to hospital policy, they were unable to administer aid to someone outside the hospital. According to legal policies, they were unable to walk down the ramp of that hospital to help a young person who needed it. In fact, it took a significant amount of time for a police officer to finally be allowed to get a wheelchair and wheel it down to where Christopher was waiting. He then wheeled him into the hospital and staff began rendering aid. Unfortunately, Christopher passed away from his wounds an hour later. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that story, I get angry. I'm angry at the people who crafted the policy. I'm angry at the people who were unable to see what was actually happening and to go help that person. I'm angry that a young person is dead because people were so caught up in doing what was right according to the law and they missed the value of a person. And I'm angry because I have realised that I am like those hospital staff in my faith at times. There are times when I fall into the trap of just waiting for people to come into this building before I start to share who God is with them. I'm angry because I realise that there are times that I prioritise legality, comfort and process over the people who need to hear a message that could quite literally save their life. We are in a series taking us up to Easter called This Is Us. We're exploring who God has called us to be as a church in this city. And as a church, we have four core statements, four anchor statements. Pursuing Jesus, connecting communities, releasing compassion and transforming lives. These statements guide who we are as a church. And today, I want to continue looking at pursuing Jesus. We started last week. And as Blake said last week, Jesus is the very core of who we are as a church. If we don't get pursuing Jesus right, then we're not going to be able to get all the other ones right either. And so today I want to look at two more of the statements that sit under this idea, this anchor of pursuing Jesus. But before I share the first statement, I want to remind you, these statements are aspirational. These statements are who we are wanting to be. These statements are where we are aiming for, what we are wanting to achieve. But we are a work in progress. We're not there yet. But we are seeking it. Statement number one says this, we see our church where people desire to become more Christ-like, a lifelong journey and commitment to growing each and every day. That's a big statement, huh? Pursuing Jesus is not just about seeking him. It's not just about spending time with him, though that is a huge part of it. But it's actually about pursuing Christ-likeness in our lives. We pursue him to be more like him, to grow into him. And we're never going to achieve that, not perfectly. Now, I do know some lovely older people who I think are getting pretty darn close. But they've had a lot more time and practice than I have. And in all honesty, it's not actually about achieving it. 
But instead, the point is that we are seeking it. The point is that we are desiring it. The point is that we are making a commitment each and every day to choose, I want to be more like Jesus. One of the passages of Scripture that we have tied to this statement is Ephesians 4, 11 to 17. And I love the way that Eugene Peterson, in the message paraphrase, has put it. He handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work. Working within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive like Christ. No prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate babes in the woods, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love, like Christ, in everything. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything that we do. He keeps us in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up healthy in God, robust in love. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. We are called to become fully mature adults, fully developed within and without. We want to be fully alive like Christ. His very breath, his blood flows through us. It nourishes us. We are to become like Christ in everything, to grow up. This is a big year in the Anderson household. My eldest daughter, Hannah, has started coming to Girl Zone on a Friday night. She is old enough to come to our Friday night program. She's old enough to start going to Camp Clayton holiday camps. She's old. (laughs) Not only that, but this is the first year that all three of my daughters are at school. My youngest, Abby, has started kinder this year and she loves it. I'll be honest with you, I love it too, and not just because this means that at, on Wednesdays all the girls are at school and Emma and I have a day at home together. Definitely helps. But I love it because it means my girls are growing up. I love seeing them step up to new things. I love seeing them change. And I have to admit, sometimes I look at these things and I have a bit of a panic. They're not so little anymore. They're getting more and more independent, but... Isn't that the point? As parents, isn't what we want for our children to grow up, to step into who God has created them to be, to step into their potential, to be the people that they were intended to be? And do you know what? God is our Father. He wants the same for us. He doesn't want us to just remain children of the faith. He wants us to grow in our faith, to become like Jesus, to become fully mature. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but God doesn't want you to stay the same. He wants you to grow. He wants you to change. He wants you to step into who you were created to be, who you were intended to be, to become fully mature inside and out. But as we grow like Christ... Something happens to us. When we pursue Jesus, our hearts beat like his. Now, I don't mean that literally, though that would be pretty cool. But that passage in Ephesians talks about being fully developed within and without. Inside and out, formed to be like Christ. God doesn't want us to just act like Jesus on the outside. He wants our hearts to beat like Christ did. He wants us to care for the same things, for the same priorities, for the same people that Jesus cared for. 
you ever noticed that the more time you spend with someone, the more you start to speak like them? The more you start to act like them? Have you ever noticed that the more time that you spend with someone that you care about, you start to get passionate and care about the things that they're passionate about and they care about? That's part of what it means to be a relational human being. It's part of what it means to be a person. And it's good. And when we pursue Jesus, when we spend time with him, we find ourselves getting passionate about the things that Jesus was passionate about. We're passionate about following the Father's will. We're passionate for the people who make up his church, but we are passionate for the people who are outside of his church. We have compassion for those people around us because we know that they matter. And those things that broke Christ's heart begins to break our hearts as well. Does this describe your heart? Does it beat like Jesus? Do you have compassion for those people around you? Does your heart ache for those things that made Jesus' heart ache for? Because Luke chapter 15 describes Jesus' heartbeat. There are three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. They highlight his heart. They highlight the father's heart that every individual matters. Every single person matters. Every single person was formed by God and they matter to him. God's desire is that everyone would be part of his family. That is why Jesus came to earth. He came to show the way to God, to make the way to God for us. God the Father cares about every single individual. They all matter to him. He shaped them. He formed them all. And they are all so incredibly valuable and important to them, to him. Last week, Blake said that when we pursue Jesus, that means we can't pursue other things. We can't pursue Jesus and Buddha. We can't pursue Jesus and atheism. We can't pursue Jesus and also believe that this is my truth. And that's your truth. And that's okay. And we're all going to, everything's all going to work out in the end. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None may come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to life itself. And so Jesus' heart ached for those people who were far from God. And the reason that he's heart ached so much for them. The reason that his heart broke for them is because he knew that because they're far from God, that this is literally a case of life and death for them. He wanted to spend time with them in eternity. He wants to know them for eternity. He wants them to be part of God's family. Is this your heart? Does it ache for those people who don't yet know Jesus? Because the second statement of our church is this. We see our church so overtaken with a desire, a desire to reach the lost and expand God's kingdom. A church where found people find people with a desire to move beyond the walls of the church. A desire to reach the lost and expand God's kingdom. We want to have our hearts beat the same as Jesus. To care about those who are far from God, who feel like they don't deserve him. We want to tell them about Jesus because he loves them. And so do we. The Great Commission is to all followers of Jesus. All of us are called. All of us are sent on a mission by God to go into all the world and make disciples. That doesn't mean you have to go halfway around the world because there are a lot of people who need to hear about Jesus right here in Devonport. Every follower of Christ is called to go into the world seeking to find those who are lost. Because we are a church where found people 
find people. We are a church that knows when we are found by Jesus that there is a celebration in heaven, but we don't want to just sit in that celebration. We don't want to just sit there and enjoy that. We want to go and we want to share that good news. We want to seek to find more people. We want to share the hope that we have in Christ. This is the heart of Christ that he is developing within us. This is the heart that we see in Luke chapter 15. And I want to read the parable of the lost sheep. It comes from verses 1 to 7, and it says this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous who do not need to repent. Can I just say I love it when Jesus gets a bit of attitude? Jesus heard the Pharisees and the tax collectors muttering about the people that he was spending time with because to them, they avoided sinners like their lives depended on it. They thought that God thought the same about them that he wasn't interested, that they didn't matter to him. But Jesus knew those people who were far from God. He knew that they were important. He knew they were valuable. He knew they mattered. And so he hears the mutters and he says, you want to know why I spend time with them? Let me tell you what God is really like. Jesus has attitude. But there are some things that stand out in this parable. The first is that people are valuable The shepherd leaves 99 who are safe and goes looking for the one who is lost. Individuals matter to God. They have value to him. He seeks the one. I also see that heaven loves a party. Every time when that which is lost is found, there is a celebration. There is a community that gathers around to celebrate because that valuable thing has been found. But there's something else that I notice in this story, and that is to find people, we need to leave our comfort zone. That shepherd was looking for a lost sheep. If he just stayed in his field, he wasn't going to find that sheep. He had to go out into the wilderness. He had to go out of his comfort zone. I shared the story of Christopher at the start of the message today. A tragedy that happened because hospital staff weren't willing to see a life instead of just the rules. Imagine if we were not willing to leave our church building, but instead we just waited for people to walk in here before we started to share about God with them. Now, please don't misunderstand me. There is a difference between inviting somebody to church and just expecting them to walk in the front doors off the street. Think about all the people that drive past this place every day. All the people that we go to school or work with. All the people in shops or who live nearby. Imagine all the lives that would never be impacted if we weren't willing to leave this building. If we just waited here for them. Because there are so many people who live in Devonport who need to be found. They are crying out to be found. But to be found, they need someone to go and find them, to reach out to them. They need someone to go up to them and to invite them in. Or even better, to offer to bring them in. Because the shepherd brought the sheep back on his shoulders. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go walking along the footpaths and pick people up and put them on our shoulders to bring them in the church. There will be complaints. (laughs) But there is power 
rather than just inviting someone, actually bringing them, offering to pick them up and bring them in to church with you. And as I'm speaking right now, I wonder, are there people's faces going through your mind right now? People that you know who don't know Jesus. Maybe it is a friend, a teacher, a work colleague. Maybe it's a family member, an aunt or uncle, a parent, a grandparent, a spouse, a child. Part of what it means to have a heart that beats like Jesus is that we need to step out of our comfort zone and we need to share about Jesus with these people who our hearts break for. We need to be able to tell them about what God has done in our lives, the hope that we have. And I'll be honest, this situation has become a lot more real to me lately. Just before Christmas, I had an aunt pass away. And I'll be honest, my family don't always like talking about faith and religion. And I don't know where she stood with Jesus. I'm very blessed that at this point I still have three grandparents living. They're all in their 90s. One of them is 99, almost 100. But out of those three grandparents who are living, I don't know where two of them stand with God. That's hard. That's tough. And I need to step out of my comfort zone and I need to have some conversations with them. But they, those conversations aren't easy, especially when they're with family, especially when they're with people who see you at your best and at your worst. When those conversations can make things awkward. But every life is valuable. And when our hearts beat like Jesus, the importance of these conversations come out, we realize that this is literally a matter of life and death. So often the issue is we don't actually know how to, what to say. So here's my advice. One, pray. Pray for Holy Spirit to prepare you because these conversations are going to make you uncomfortable. Things are going to get awkward. But ask Holy Spirit to guide you. Two, ask questions. Not to get your point across, but to listen and to hear where they are coming from. To hear where they are at. And then you can start from there. Three, be honest about your story. Be honest about the hope that you have in your life. Be honest about what God has done to transform your life, to change your life. And the last thing to remember is have that conversation in love. We don't have these conversations to tick off a religious to-do list. We have them because our hearts beat like Jesus. We love them like Jesus loves them. We care about them like he loves them. And we want the best for them. You don't need a degree in order to share how Jesus has changed your life. How he is growing you to be more like him. You just need a heart that beats like his. The next parable is found in verses 8 to 10 and it says... Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house carefully and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This parable is so similar to the lost sheep, but it tells us something important about seeking that which is lost. Finding people takes time, effort, and a plan. This woman seeking a lost coin, she needed to put time and effort into the search. She would have lived in a house with a dirt floor. There wouldn't have been windows. 
There were probably reeds on the ground to help cover up the dirt. And that coin lost on the ground would be almost impossible to see or to find. So she needed a plan. So this woman lights a lamp so that she can see a glimmer of the coin on the ground. And then she listens carefully as she sweeps so that she can hear the sound of the coin as it moves along the ground. And she didn't just sweep haphazardly. She searched carefully. She had a plan. She started here and then swept here, and then swept here, and swept here, until eventually she found the coin. Finding people takes time and effort and a plan. People are introduced to Jesus through relationship. They are saved when people pour into their lives again and again and again over time. Conversation after conversation. People interceding for them in prayer again and again and again. And if we want to be a church where found people find people, then we need to be strategic about it. We need to be willing to invest time and effort and strategy into finding people, into building relationships. We need to share our story with them, to share the hope that we have, to show how Jesus has changed our lives. This is not just us trying to do a good deed. This is because we care about them, like Jesus cares about them. But we also need to remember we don't save people. Holy Spirit saves people. But he uses us. He uses our stories. He uses the efforts that we put in in that process. And so we need to pray for people to come to Christ. We need to pray for Holy Spirit to prepare the soil of their heart. And we need to pray, we need to pray for God to lead us to those people who are ready for us to share the gospel with them. We need to be willing to plant seeds, to water seeds, to weed and plant and water We also need to remember we don't do this alone. God didn't intend for us to do this by ourselves. This woman lit a lamp. She swept her house. She didn't rely on one way to find that lost coin. She used multiple ways. We have a community of believers. We have small groups who can gather around somebody and pray for them as they go and have these conversations. They can pray for the courage and the words to say as they go out and get out of their comfort zone, as they get uncomfortable and have those conversations. We can introduce people to others from church. We can show them what this community is like and what this community means to see the community that is actually found here. We can invite them and bring them along to events. Young people have youth group, boys' zone and girls' zone, opportunities to come and belong and to be part of something and then to hear the gospel. This year as a church, we are having opportunities to reach out. Later on in the year, we're going to be having open house parties. We're going to be sharing about, the, about hospitality and what it means for biblical hospitality. We're going to have Reach Weekend with John Meller later on in the year. And we have services every single Sunday where Jesus is shared. Opportunities when people are invited to them where they can hear and they can see what Jesus is all about. Found people finding people. It's not a quick thing. It is something that takes time and effort and energy, but the result is so worth it. Luke 15 records the incredible celebrations that happen every time someone is found. People are valuable. Every life matters to God. He's calling for us to go into the world and to celebrate as people are found. We are a church that wants to grow more like Jesus. Every day we are desiring, we are making a commitment to grow more like Jesus, to be formed like him inside 
and out. To have our hearts transformed to be like his. Because when that happens, as a church, we are filled with a desire to reach the lost. Found people, find people. Because we know that we have found a love that is so incredible, that has transformed our lives completely. These statements as a church are aspirational, but they are who we are wanting to be. They are who we are seeking to be. And so my question for you this week is this. Where are you going to go looking for some of God's people who need to be found?